Hello, my name is Chai. In this video, I want to go over the basics of procedural shading. But to get to procedural shading, we first have to start out with normal shading. I've set up an icosphere. So let's see how light interacts with this geometry. And it has a shader on it, which tells it how light should interact with it. I currently have an HDRI, which is lighting from all angles. But let's just see how it looks when I render. So this is metallic. It has some anisotropic shading. It has light following the grooves of its surface. This is pretty common to see in brushed metal usually, but let's move on to the second one I have, which is glass. So here light is coming at it at some random angle and it is bouncing around inside of this object and then passing back out. So we can change our view to see it at all kinds of angles and zoom in very far. And really soon, you're, you're gonna see how these were made and how this is actually really simple. So our next one is the plastic. This is just kind of rough, simple plastic. It has some nice reflections. So after seeing these, you might be wondering how I set these up. And the answer is procedural shading. So first off, we know that shading is all about how light interacts with an object. So procedural shading, we can basically describe it as using noise. What I mean by noise is these random varying patterns that we have, not the kind of noise you're hearing right now. One kind of randomness we have is Perlin noise. In this case, I'm using it to do something pretty special. It's called normal mapping, which basically means I have this single object. It has four vertices. There's no extra geometry here. But when I shade it, I'm having light interact with it as if there was some extra geometry. See how this bit is kind of protruding? But our geometry really is completely flat. It's made up of these four verts. But when our shader, but when we render it out, our shader is basically telling the render engine, you should shade it as if this face was pointing at a certain angle. And this can be used in all kinds of ways. It lets you make really complex results without using much computational power at all. It's very energy efficient. This is super useful. It really looks like there's some protrusions here, but it's actually the shader. This only has four verts. It's an infinitely flat plane. So let's learn how we can set these up and how we can make some more advanced things in the future. Like I mentioned earlier, procedural shading has to do with noise and randomness. One example of noise is this noise texture. It has two outputs, factor and color, but right now we're working with only black and white values, so we will use factor. Very basically, this noise can generate a cool organic looking result and it's not an image even though this looks like an image it's actually a 3d volume and we're just looking at a slice of it so if we shift it on the z-axis up we can see it kind of scrolling through right in procedural shading we use noise patterns it's called procedural shading because each of these noise patterns are built up of many small procedures you may have noticed that everything looks like a block. Every piece of information is either a noodle, like this line here, or a block, what are called nodes. Every block either stores some kind of information, like this texture coordinate node, or it can transform data. Data, we can visualize as these lines here. Usually, I use a texture coordinate node as a starting point. So, the order of operation goes from left to right. The material output is basically what we see. These noodles don't have to be straight lines though. We can change them using these reroute nodes to make them any shape we want. We can also use our usual 3D graphics transformations on them. And we can do that for nodes too. So here I'm inverting my selection and rotating. So now that you're at least a bit familiar with noodles and nodes, Let's show how I use shading to get those results we saw earlier. So in this case, I'm using a principled BSDF node, often shortened to PrinceBSDF. A principled node is basically an ultimate shader. It's the default shader that you start out with, and it's really used to make all kinds of things. This node has tons of parameters, and it is able to get many results using only these sliders. So if we wanted to turn this kind of 
frosted glass into metal, we could increase metallic, decrease roughness, and increase anisotropic. But if we want to make it glass again, we have this transmission slider, which lets light pass through it. I won't really be explaining the Prince node, but it can get you really, really far. The main reason I'm making this video is not to teach the ordinary kind of shading. For the past two months, I've been practicing a new kind of shading. I want to show you how I make logos and symbols using only procedural shading. Very few people do this at a high level, so I want to teach you how you can do it. Here's an example of one of my advanced shaders. This scene has a plane with four vertices and a shader that looks like this. Let me zoom in for more detail. This shader is animated. Let me show you what it looks like. Again, this is made with only shading. There is no modeling or geometry nodes in this. All I've done is use nodes to get this output. The way I do this is by manipulating values. Let me explain what that means. Here's a starting setup that uses object coordinates. And let's say I want to draw a circle. I can use a vector math node and set it to length to get this gradient and then use a math node set to less than to get a solid color. Then I can change this threshold to change the size of this circle. But let's say we want to get a bit more advanced with it. Instead of making circles, we want to make a square. For this, we can use a separate XYZ node and a math node set to absolute, then less than, duplicate this setup, use it for the Y, and multiply these two outputs together. We have a vertical bar and a horizontal bar. Now, when we multiply them, we'll find exactly where they overlap. The reason we do this is because we can change these parameters at any time, but it gets a lot more advanced than just squares and circles. We can make a flower shape using a radial gradient that looks like this, and multiplying its factor by four, or however many petals you want on your flower, then setting another math node to fraction, adding another one set to subtract by 0.5. This gives us half negative values, then flipping these negatives with absolute and using a less than. But instead of using just a single value as a threshold, let's make this gradient and set this as the threshold. This gives us this result. Now we can multiply to increase the number of petals or decrease. Here we have five and here we have 10. We can go back to two, three, four, five, six at any point in time using only this single slider. I would recommend you snap it to whole numbers though. You don't want half a petal, like here I have 3.5. So here's a very simple node setup and you can do anything you want with it. This is the node setup. You can screenshot it and mess around with it, have fun. It's cool, but it's not really advanced yet. Let's go look at another project I've made. Using only a plane, I've made the CG Boost logo with only shaders. This took around 1,700 nodes, and it took about four days to make. Each of these colors can be changed to whatever you want. Here is a blue and purple CG Boost logo. In case you didn't know, CG Boost is a company that teaches Blender. People often ask how this is math, which is understandable at first, but once you zoom into my node setups, you realize that I'm almost only using math operations using vector math nodes set to add, length, less than, multiply, sine, greater than, and all of these transformations take place in the nodes. So I'm not typing out any programming. I'm using only this visual scripting system. People usually think this takes a lot of work and it makes a worse result than just being able to draw something or animate it. But I think it can be used to make designs and animations that people don't see usually. It can't be drawn by hand because they're using fractal noise in all of these advanced math systems. So it really is the intersection between math and art. Here's an animation I made using only procedural shading. I do it because I love math, 
I, I want to show the really practical applications for math in the real world, and I can do that with shaders. If you're interested in procedural shading, you probably are because you clicked on this video, you can check out my channel on YouTube, and I should have about 16 videos as of recording. Let me know what you think. Maybe I can inspire you to make a video on math, shading, geometry, all kinds of things.